Professor Elmar Kotter. He comes from the Department of Radiology, Freiburg University Medical Center, Germany. His research has focused on this theme, citizen-centered health data solutions. Good morning, Elmar. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And thank you for the invitation to speak today. So, as you have been saying, I am a radiologist working in a beautiful Freiburg in the southern part of Germany, the capital of the Black Forest. And as a radiologist and as a citizen also, I consider myself being more on the application side more than on the technical side. And let me just share a few thoughts about what citizen-centered healthcare data solutions uh, means and please apologize if I'm somewhat radiology centric in what I'm going to say. So let's have a look at the evolution of healthcare. So today we are talking about healthcare 4.0, which is compared to industry 4.0 and where we come from, from uh, simple healthcare 1.0 with patient encounters and diagnosis and treatment then 2.0 with modern medical equipment and monitoring devices. Then what we have today are electronic health records. We have uh, computers, of course, and we have some remote care and telehealth. And now we are talking about healthcare 4.0, which is about smart health, connected care, personalized medicine, and artificial intelligence. That is something AI that we see already emerging in radiology. So how can we define what are the main points when we think about citizen-centered healthcare data solutions? And this term means that we put the needs of individuals at the center of the healthcare system and empower the citizens to take control of their own health. Citizens should be able to access, review and manage their own health data thus empowering them to take a more active role in their own healthcare and to make informed decisions about their own health. And we want to enable citizens to better understand their health data. We need to be able to explain them, for instance, test results, and to give them also access to educational material. We see that has already been said in the previous talk. We see more and more smart devices. We have the Internet of Things. We are also talking about the Internet of Medical Things. And of course, we talk about 6G. So we see an increasing number of smart or wearable personal devices that will be generating health data in the future. Those medical devices will be foreseeable connected to the Internet of Things. And 6G with faster speed and lower latency will be used to enhance speed and reliability of the communication of these health data. And the transmission of those data in real time to healthcare providers will enable us to be more proactive in our healthcare. Why are we talking about citizen centered? health data, because we want to engage citizens or patients to take care of their own health. We want to have, instead of we have now reactive healthcare, we want to have a proactive and preventive healthcare. We want to bring better healthcare to citizens in remote areas, something we heard about just five minutes ago, which we could call virtual healthcare. And we need to better connect patients with their healthcare providers in a broader sense. So this is one of the slides presenting the 6G FSS. And uh, you can see that some of the topics, some of the topics I have already been talking about are very well addressed by your program. So you are going to address citizen-centered data-driven preventive healthcare. We have the preventive aspect here. We are talking about virtual healthcare service development and also again about preventive healthcare 
and citizens' data servers and consumer participation and sensor devices. This is a, an infographic coming from the European Commission showing the results or the expectations of EU citizens on the left side. So if you ask the citizens in the European Union, you find that 90% of all citizens would agree that they want access to their own health data. 80% would agree to share their health data if privacy and security are ensured, of course. And also 80% of citizens would agree to provide feedback on quality of treatments, which is a very important aspect today. So the European Commission has identified three main topics that have to be addressed, which is the secure access and exchange of health data, then to have health data pooled for research and personalized medicine, and to have digital tools and data for citizen empowerment and person-centered healthcare. Here, once again, you have those three priorities more in detail. So first of all, citizens need secure access to their health data, including across borders, very important within the European Union. Second, personalized medicine through shared European infrastructures for researchers and other professionals to pool resources. And I will show you an example later of these efforts. And very important, citizen empowerment with digital tools for personal health care and user feedback. And this is exactly what we are talking about today. So, we see today a slow but progressing change, transformation in the healthcare industry. We are changing from an on-demand healthcare and reactive healthcare and something which is consumption of healthcare to healthcare that is patient-centered and encourages patients to manage themselves their health, which means that they need access to health data and they really are expected to participate. And this will change the role of all participants in healthcare. The payers will shift from being just payers uh, paying the bills to players in the healthcare system. The providers will also change their role will shift from being something like the captain of the shift, being more the navigator in a more and more complex healthcare system. And the people, the citizens, will change from a very passive role to a more active role to being engaged in their own health. And we will see, we already see, and we will see more and more of this, which is the manifold sources of health data. I mean, we forever we had notes, handwritten notes, then notes on the computer, discharge letters, and so on. We today have computer-based records, of course. We have native digital data like CT, MRI, ECG, and so on. And we will have more and more medical devices connected to the healthcare system in the future. As you can see on the left side, this Digisphere. And we will also see more and more personal lifestyle devices like smartphones, smartwatches, and many other things to come. And of course, there are also some other sources like the internet search history or internet orders, which can give some information about the health status of our citizens. Let's talk about health data, how they are stored, and how we can access health data. So in the past, we talked about paper-based health records, and then we had electronic health records since the 70s or 80s, and those are, were very centered on health professionals. Citizens did not have access to this kind of health data. And then we saw patient portals, especially during the last 10 or 15 years. And now 
we are switching more and more to giving even mobile access to our citizens. So we are already shifting from giving the information, making accessible the information only to healthcare professionals to give also access to the health information to citizens. What we see is a real data tsunami. We have an exponential growth of the data produced. And what you see here on this slide is the annual size of the global data sphere all data. That's not only healthcare data. And when we look at the data growth rate by industries, this is the growth rate from 2018 to 2025, you see that while the global data sphere on the right is growing by 27%, the healthcare industry will be the industry with the biggest growth in data over the next years to come. And this is confirmed by data from Freiburg. So this is the imaging data we have stored in Freiburg in our medical image archive, the PAX system, the picture archiving and communication system. And what you see here is an exponential growth in the data we store in the system. And this is the annual data production of images we see in our university hospital in Freiburg. And also this approximately is an exponential growth. And this is very similar for all kind of medical data. And we expect this to be growing even more in the coming years. And here on, on this slide, you have a citation from one senior director in IT saying that MRI image creation is driving storage requirements significantly. And what we do, what you can read here, and what I can confirm is that we are producing more and more images. We are producing today not only 2D images, we are producing 4D image data sets. And this is becoming, on one side, more and more data. But on the other hand, it's also becoming more and more difficult regarding the interpretation of these data. When I started in radiology, reading a CT meant that you got like 80 CT slides, 80 images to interpret. Today, when we are talking about a modern CT scanner, you easily get something like 2,000 to 6,000 images for one examination. So how are you going to interpret this, especially when you see that there is a shortfall in radiologists. The, on the left side, you see data from the Royal College of Radiologists. There are census report uh, from 2021 and uh, forecast that from a current existing shortfall of radiologists of 29%, they expect a shortfall of 39% of radiologists in 2026, which is a lot. And if you combine this with the increasing data production in radiology, you see what is going to happen, who is going to interpret all of these data. And similarly for other specialties, I think radiology is a good example, but that's what we also see in other medical specialties. So a healthcare 4.0 also means that we will rely on the use of AI in medicine, and that means we need data that are readable by computers, we need structured data, and we need accessible data. And this is just showing you what we are trying to build in Freiburg, which is a whole echo system with data sources on both sides of the slides. And then you have, of course, you have the images, but you also have the radiology reports, which is the result of our work. You see the AI algorithms, which, which will put send results to the radiology reports. And of course, you need some kind of data repository and so on. So you end up with a very complex system. But the important thing on this slide is we expect to be working with AI algorithms in the future. That is very important to make AI reliable. 
and recent publications show that we have more than 100 uh, AI algorithms that are uh, FTA and or CE approved today. And only very few of them showed to be reliable. And that is still a huge problem because if we want to use those algorithms in our clinical routine, we really need to know that they will work as intended. And a very simple example of interpretation of data or problem with, with the interpretation of data is the crash detection on the iPhone. Here you see a headline from the Colorado Sun from the end of last year. And the 9-11 there was really submerged with too many calls, too many automated calls from Skia iPhones detecting crashes when no crash happened. And the situation is similar in the medical field. You don't want to have false alerts, of course. You want to have the best accuracy possible from your AI systems. You also have to think about liability when you talk about AI systems. In the automotive industry, there have been defined five levels of autonomy by the Society of Automotive Engineers. And there have been attempts to transpose this to the medical field to define five levels of autonomy for medical AI. And this is a very important aspect because if you think about working with AI, you also have to think about who is going to be responsible in the end. What we do today when interpreting exams with the help of AI is that all radiologists agree in saying that you must first have the radiologist look at the examinations and then only in the second place you will use the results of the AI system, which in some way makes sense because you want the radiologist to take the final decision. But if you look at this in terms of efficiency and keeping in mind the increasing data we need to handle, this will be difficult in the future because you have no gain of efficiency if you keep radiologists looking at all the data and then also in the second place using AI. Probably we will need to switch one day and to have AI systems have the first look and then radiologists confirming the results of the AI. And what we see today is that AI, while being around in radiology and in some other medical fields for a number of years now, still is not very well accepted and introduced in a clinical routine because there are still many questions around it, about liability, about how, how good it really works, and also about who is going to pay this. And my impression is that uh, this is a situation very similar to the situation we had in the 90s when we started to introduce digital archives for our uh, imaging departments. And this was a very slow change in the beginning. Radiologists were not ready to adapt to reading on screens and to change the way they have been working. There have been concerns about security and so on. And what we saw then is that after five or six years of discussions of this would be going to work and who would be going to pay for, for this. Then we saw that the introduction of modern multi-slice CT scanners, which produced many more data than the scanners before. And this resulted in the impossibility to handle these data with film. And then radiologists switched very quickly to reading on screen and to use digital archives. And I expect that some similar tipping point with all those AI technologies, because very soon we will not be able anymore to handle this data tsunami in the way we do it today. Just let me show you 
one important European initiative, which has been announced like three weeks ago, the European Cancer Imaging Initiative, where we have a really huge project coordinated by my friend Luis Marti Bonmati and the European Society of Radiology and ABIA there, which is creating a federated European infrastructure for cancer image data. And here you can see the vision, which is to deploy a pan-European federated infrastructure to power up AI and imaging, to provide a research platform for the development and benchmarking of AI to address the fragmentation of the existing cancer imaging repositories by building a distributed atlas of cancer images, and to create a federated data warehouse for radiology. So this is a huge European project. There are 75 partners in it, and this will be growing over the time and 25 additional stakeholders. So I think the possibility to have citizen-centered health data and to handle this will be intrinsically connected to the rise of AI. And there are many challenges and opportunity. I just want to name a few of them, which is very important, the ethics of use of AI. If we want AI to be accepted, we have to do it in an ethical way and we have to make it transparent to gain the trust of our citizens in the systems we are going to use. We need AI education. In the first place, of course, for medical doctors who are going to use those systems, but we also need to some degree AI education for our citizens. If we want them to understand what we are doing and if we want to be transparent, we will see situations where the processing of information surpasses the human capacities, either because of the sheer quantity of information we need to process or because of decisions to make in a very short time. When you think about streams of information coming in, like today in intensive care units, but in the future also, when you have many, many connected portable devices and you need to make decisions, there you need also AI systems because humans will not be able to process this information anymore. You need to be able also to adapt your AI models over time. You need to monitor AI performance because this might shift over time. And then you finally you have the questions, who is going to pay for all this? Who is going to pay for all the smart health devices? Who is going to pay for AI systems in medicine? And that's really probably one of the, of the most important questions. We saw in the past that models like asking the payers to pay for prevention did not work very well. What we see in radiology is radiology AI works, but it is expensive. We don't get, at least in Germany, any additional reimbursement for using AI. The quality case, which is there, but it does not work to get the money for these systems. And we also see that the AI industry changes its orientation from getting paid by the caregivers to being paid by a pharmaceutical industry because they expect to get more prescriptions for expensive medications if certain medical conditions are diagnosed earlier by using AI. But we might expect a change of a payer's attitude from just being a payer, to be an actor, and then maybe being more interested also in handling all these incoming data in a more intelligent way by using AI systems. A few closing thoughts. E-Health certainly will change the healthcare system in a disruptive way. E-Health should be a win for all stakeholders. We need to put citizens at the center of this changement if we want it to be a success. And AI will certainly be at the center of future e-health systems. The technology will work, that's not the question, but human factors 
must be considered. We need to think about usability of technology. It must be accessible also to not so technically educated persons. Think about elderly persons, which also need to access these systems in the future. And don't forget about the ethics in these more and more complex health systems, especially regarding AI systems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Irma, for your excellent talk and pointing out also the potential and the challenges and the importance of citizens' engagement and putting patients in the center and preventive health care. And maybe I will start with my question from the field of pediatric neurology as a pediatric neurologist. So what is the timeline currently in the diagnostic process and what is your vision for the future concerning minutes if we think about the little child with the brain wide matter changes and as there are many etiologies whether it's neuroimmunological disease or neurometabolic and we have currently very targeted treatment options by which we can influence on the brain development of the child until the adulthood. What is currently the timeline if we uh, think about the work of radiologist? So when he's analyzing uh, the brain MRI scans and then uh, giving the information to clinician, the current status and comparing the minutes when I is uh, integrated. As we are suffering from the lack of radiologists, so how enormous will be the help of AI? in disease diagnostics concerning time, what the radiologists are using to analyze the, the scans. When AI is suggesting diagnosis and differential diagnostics and AI is suggesting that this is the first suggestion in priority, first diagnosis. Well, you know, predictions are always difficult, especially concerning the future. <clears throat> but I would expect to see to see those applications in the clinical routine within five to eight years. That's my personal prediction. We we know <clears throat> that many many AI applications in radiology are working today, especially in the neuroimaging domain. The question is really, how are you going to finance this? And here the case is different depending on the pressure you have. I mean, in countries where you really have a lack of radiologists, you will be more willing to pay for AI than in countries where you still have enough radiologists. But we will have a need for radiologists in all countries in the future. And so it's foreseeable that we will see the introduction of AI systems. And let me add one thought. Today, when we talk AI in radiology, we are talking about AI mostly analyzing images only. And this, as we all know, is only part of the truth, because a radiologist always, to make a good diagnosis, needs the clinical context. You know this very well. And so I expect the next generation of AI systems in radiology, but this will not be radiology only anymore, to also integrate to some point clinical information. Yes, that is very important. Thank you. And then from the audience, we have one final quick question. What are your thoughts or concerns on EU level AI regulation? Will it affect implementation of AI and AI solution practices? and real use of AI? Well, there's the new AI. There are two things. One is the AI Act, which has been much discussed. And the second thing is the European EHDS, the European Health Data Space. And while the AI Act in some points uh, is might be difficult for the introduction of AI system because of the requirements to AI systems. I think on the other hand, the European health data space 
will really help us to manage and collect data for the creation of future AI systems for medicine.